uh, notice that we are currently recording. So uh, Garzon uh, Virtual Tasting. Carrie, to All you. Right. Here we are. So I'm Carrie Folk. I'm with Pacific Highway Wines, based here in Chicago, and manage the Midwest and have the beautiful pleasure to represent Garzon in the Midwest and then also um, facilitate fun things like this. But um, with us today, we are very fortunate from the other side of the hemisphere. They have fires going and scars on their neck. Um, we have Alec Griffith, who's going to be the um, the export director from Garzon with 20, or, yep, 16 years of um, international travel under his belt and has been at the winery for a number of years now. And then also for a short time, we have gotten the, the big head the head honcho, Christian Wiley, who is the managing director for Garzon as well, um, in his car, Hello. bundled up. And um, without further ado, I'm going to let Alec and Christian um, really just relay the wonderful stories of Garzon. Um, and then we're going to walk through the tasting and do questions. Um, and I'll share some information about just national sales and how we're doing too. But um, without further ado, gentlemen, take it away. Thanks, uh, Joe and Carrie. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it's definitely very exciting for us to, to be able to, to reach out from Uruguay to Illinois. Um, and, you know, how technology is helping out. It's quite amazing. Um, well, we're going to go through, through the presentation. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of slides. It's mostly pictures. So hopefully it's not too, you know, death by PowerPoint for you guys. Uh, but it does help kind of to, to see images of, of the winery and this is what we're doing here. Um, and uh, well, jumping into it, everyone can see it right now? It's on? Yeah? Yep. Good. So basically what you're seeing here, uh, I just want to briefly present and explain uh, the project with one picture. It's not easy. <laughs> But what you're seeing here is basically it's the, the, the building, the winery. Um, this is the tourism area and restaurant. We'll talk about everything in more detail, but this is just for you to have an idea. The members club and the production facility, the winery is on this side and goes all the way down. It's under, underground, right? And what you see, it's basically one third of the vineyard. The other third goes along this way, uh, on, on the other side of the hill. And basically here, it's the Atlantic Ocean. So what you see there, the horizon, just 11 miles from the winery, that's the Atlantic Ocean. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk more details on, on how all this affects uh, Garçon, uh, our vineyard, and of course the wines. But I just want to give you kind of one, you know, full screen of everything. Um, but before jumping into Garçon and the project and our terroir, you know, let me give you a bit of information about Uruguay because it's a small country, a super small country. So I always like to, you know, at least give some, some basic data. It's 3.4 million people. You know, it's basically smaller than Chicago in a way, um, in population, I mean. But it's a place where with a very high literacy rate, very good education, public health care. Um, and actually, we are very, very proud because uh, we've gone through, through the, up to now, through the pandemic in, in a very good way. Uh, you know, very few uh, active cases and deaths. And we actually never had lockdown. So we've been uh, quite lucky. Where, where is Uruguay? It's, it's a very important question. And, you know, it's most of the time when you talk about Southern Hemisphere, you hear about Mendoza or Maipo in Chile or Stellenbosch or Marosa Valley in Australia. Basically, Uruguay is in the same exact latitude, right? Uh, 35. So it's south of Brazil and east of Argentina, just there next to the Atlantic Ocean. So this means, you know, we have the same sun exposure as top Southern Hemisphere um, wine regions, but very different uh, conditions, basically because the Atlantic Ocean and, and soils, which, which I'll mention now. So this is a map of Uruguay, the whole country. You drive from one side to the other in four hours. <laughs> um, and this side, 
on the on the west you have Argentina, and on the north up here you have Brazil. Right? You see the mouse, right? Yeah. Um, basically, what you see here in pattern it's the wine regions of Uruguay, um, and you know I'll, I'll go through this quite fast. But it's important to explain Garzón, um, basically because the wine industry in Uruguay has been around 200 years, same as Chile or Argentina. People don't know much about Uruguay and wines. Smaller ones, they need help. Because it's only 200 wineries and mostly most of the production is actually sold domestically. We don't, the industry doesn't export much. But there's two wine, traditional wine regions, which is Canelones and Colonia. Um, and now the developing area, and what you're hearing more and more, and where Glasson is, is on the east, down here, Maldonado. And I'm explaining this just to show, to prove our point of, you know, what we're doing is developing a 21st century terroir. It was a place uh, 12 years ago when we started planting the vineyards there was no vineyards around. So everything is kind of a trial. It's a, a huge experiment, expensive, uh, you know, an important bet. But um, at the end of the day, it is that. Um, and here you can see it's Atlantic Ocean and the, and the soils on the east of the country, this area, are granite. While on the west, this is a river, so it's fresh water, and this is clay soils. So it's very, very different. Um, and why we came to the East was exactly looking for the ocean proximity and the granite. I mentioned this because we're gonna taste Alvarino and Rosé, and you, you'll understand my point in a minute. Um, going, you know, zooming in into where we are, this is uh, Garzón. You see, you see up here, it says Garzón. That's the name of the, where we have the winery, of course, and the vineyards. It's actually the name of the town and the name of the county. So it's kind of like uh, Chateau Margot in Margot, it's at the Poder Garçon in Garçon County. Um, and this is, you know, just to get everyone uh, a bit uh, excited and, and invite you over to come uh, and visit, because the whole area is basically the top summer destination in the Southern Hemisphere. This town here called Jose Ignacio is kind of like Saint-Tropez, where beach, restaurants, everyone dressed in white. Um, and the best thing for you guys, that our summer is December, March, so you can escape the, <laughs> the cold uh, Chicago weather in Illinois. Um, and Punta del Este, this is, you know, 30-minute uh, drive to Jose Ignacio and 45-minute drive to Punta Este, which is kind of like uh, Monaco with uh, casinos, nightlife, uh, clubs. So it's quite a fun place to come and visit. Uh, and that's, you know, Uruguay being only 3 million people, we receive 3 million tourists in summer. It, it really is a, a easy, easy place to come and visit. So we've developed a lot of tourism at the winery. So, outside, we have a, a restaurant called Gasson, um, where basically the creative director is Francis Malman. Uh, I guess some of you guys know him from Chef's Table, or, you know, he's quite famous. Uh, Argentinian chef, cooks everything with fire. So, it's a great uh, experience on, on tasting our, you know, wines, pairing with local food which is an amazing culinary experience. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. I'll, I'll go fast with this, but, you know, blending sessions, different tours that people take. But, you know, we're using this as a huge platform because the 20,000 people that we're receiving at the winery, none of them are Uruguayans. So it's our platform to, you know, spread the word to the world of what's happening. And we're very proud because last year we received the second place on World Best Vineyards. And um, I know Joe asked not to say yesterday, <laughs> but basically yesterday uh, we received the 
2020 um, results, and we're again the second um, in the top 50. So super proud. Um, in going more into the project, all all this is the vision of Mr. Alejandro Bulgeroni. He's the owner. Um, he's Argentinian with Italian uh, background. So he always saw this kind of like a little Tuscany, uh, the whole area where we have the, the winery. And I'll explain you uh, briefly why. This is just to show you the, the proximity to the ocean. It's 11 miles. Um, and this is the pull the rock of granite that I was mentioning. So super important, I'll, I'll stop here a minute to explain. Um, anywhere in the vineyard, if you start digging a hole, you're gonna hit that rock anywhere between one feet to three feet, four feet. Um, and the rootstock of the vineyard, now that it's 11, 12 years old, the oldest mines, is, are basically breaking into the rock. So we're achieving very nice minerality. But the most important is the drainage it gives us. Because in Uruguay, it rains a lot. Being so close to the ocean, we get a lot of storms and a lot of water coming in. So having a good drainage was the number one priority uh, of having a, you know, a healthy vineyard and, and not using any chemicals. Um, and it's incredible. It can rain um, 80 millimeters. I'm not sure how much is that is in inches, but I mean, could rain this amount of water and you can walk through the vineyards with no boots. It's basically sand, right? So it goes very fast. And going back to the little Tuscany, so the way they planted the vineyard is in a thousand five hundred small parcels, small blocks. Because in the picture you don't see it very well, but this is rolling hills. So basically we play with different orientations towards the sun, towards the ocean. Um, here you can see the ocean in the background. Um, and given this is a trial, um, as I explained in the beginning, there was no vineyards around. So when they started planting, they didn't know exactly you know, what to go for. Um, there's 16 different grapes planted today in the vineyard. Number one is Tanat. Um, and number two is Alvarinho. So our focus for red and white will taste both today. But there's also Sauvignon Blanc, Marcelin, Cap Franc. Um, and a lot of them are still trials. You know, if they work, we, we plant more. If they don't, we just go for a new one. Um, and here you can see, don't worry about remembering this, but this is just basically to explain how in one property, we 16 different grapes. And for example, this is the top of a hill where in one side you have Sauvignon Blanc and in the other you have Tanat. So it's southern exposure, northern exposure. That's basically how we're playing. It's a bit messy. Um, you know, I'm not sure even the vineyard manager knows what's where. <laughs> but uh, it really, really helps, you know, uh, it gives us the chance of, of really take, getting the best um, the best conditions for each grade. Um, I know Christian had to jump off um, earlier, so I'm not sure if he's still around and he wants to say something before. Uh, I'm not stopping. I'm not leaving any, any time to him to talk. <laughs> uh, no, it's, but, okay. it's okay, Alec. You're doing a, a great job. Keep going. All right, there you go. Um, Basically, jumping into the winery, um, the owner coming from the energy business wanted to really prove that you can do anything on a sustainable way. So the whole winery, which took six years to build, is um, as sustainable as you can be. Uh, actually, last year, we got the LEED certification for all the production facilities. So restaurant, uh, winery, uh, bottling facility, and even the vineyard managing, everything has been certified. So we produce our own energy with windmills, uh, it's gravity flow production. Um, you, you can see the green roof here, natural light in every room. So basically 
when when they took the decision of, of investing in this, yeah, you know, you have to consider it because it's fifty um, percent more expensive to build the winery uh, to achieve this certification. But on the long term, of course, you know, it, it, you should get, get the money back, uh, and of course, you know, it's. We wanted to preserve all the biodiversity of the area. We wanted to be the minimum impact on the landscape, um, basically uh, where we are. Um, so it's a beautiful, beautiful winery. Uh, we use a lot of these concrete tulip shaped tanks, uh, and a lot of concrete, basically. Um, the, the, the legacy of this is Alberto Antonini. He's the winemaker consultant of the project. He's been uh, basically holding hands with Mr. Bugloni since day one on this project. He brought all the um, vineyard and winery and, and the wine knowledge into the project. And Mr. Bugloni, the passion and, and the energy to, to push it, to make it real. Um, and Alberto uses concrete. A lot of concrete, we'll explain it more while we taste the wines, but it's just for you to know. Um, and a lot of untoasted French oak. Um, we use basically 100% French and 100% or 95% untoasted. Um, we'll talk about more in detail while we taste as well. But also with time, in the last... Um, six years, we've been switching from regular barriques to big casks of 5,000 liters like this. So basically it's, uh, we're going towards a less uh, oak contact uh, with the wine. Um, these are, I just mentioned really fast. Um, the, the Garçon Club is basically a billionaire's club uh, where Mr. Bugironi started on this journey of wine and, uh, 12 years ago with Garçon, it was his first uh, wine project. But in these 12 years, he's been uh, super passionate about it and being and bought properties, uh, vineyards and wineries in, in six different countries, in Italy, France, the US, Australia, Argentina, and Uruguay. So he's basically developed a club where you become a member and you're a global viticulture because you can travel to each of the wineries and do your own wine. So let's say, you know, they become a member, they do a wine in a son and they go to Napa, to the property, and other women state and do their own. So it's a, you know, it's a way of becoming a global viticulture and each of the, the wineries is, um, has a, a golf course um, next to it. You know, the one at Gerson is actually the first PGA destination course outside the US. So it's quite, quite uh, fantastic. Um, this is the whole portfolio uh, that we have in the US. Um, you'll see basically today we'll taste through the Reserva wines, four different wines of the Reserva tier. Basically, on top of the Reserva tier, we have a single vineyard here. Uh, I'll just mention it fast, we're going to taste for them, but it's the selection of the best parcels of each grape, right? So the best parcels of Albarino, of Pinot Noir. Uh, remember the parcels are super small, so the quantities are, are very limited. Petit Clos tier is one single parcel, so we do 2,000, 3,000 bottles, that's it, of each one. And Balasto, which is our Icon wine, it's a blend of our top components, every vintage. So it changes year to year. Uh, we can talk about it later, but I know you guys want to taste. That's what we're here for. So, um, the first wine we'll taste is the Albariño. Um, well, this is just a lot of accolades we've had. Uh, we're very proud of it. Um, really, the winemaking team has done a massive, massive job. Um, first wine, Albariño, Reserva, um, I'll taste with you guys. Basically, uh, it's, it's a very interesting story behind it uh, because there was, no, there was no Albariño in Uruguay when we started planting. Um, 
even in South America, I think it was only, it was very, very little. So when, when we started, we had to bring the Albariño from Galicia. And why was that? It's basically because studying the conditions, we found a lot of similarities with Galicia, right? With the Atlantic Ocean proximity, with the granite soils, um, with quite a lot of sun exposure uh, and the amount of rain, a lot of rain. So we knew Alvarino was a, a grape that, you know, potentially could really express well and it could survive our kind of um, wild conditions. Um, so the first trials were planted in 2008. Today is our focus, uh, great white grape variety. Uh, as, as you saw, we have 35 hectares, so that's around 70 acres of Alvarino. It's quite funny because the whole of Uruguay has 85 acres. So we are by far the biggest producer. Um, but we're seeing more and more and more people talking about it because it, it's kind of finding its second home, Alvarino, after Spain and, and Portugal. Um, on the vinification, what we do with the Reserva, the Alvarino and the Rosé with taste, it's 100% stainless steel. Um, basically, what we want to do here is preserve the fruit character, the, that freshness, that natural acidity, um, and, you know, make it a very fresh wine. Um, so stainless steel, basically, it's our go-to, uh, you know, just really keeping the, the, the expression of the fruit. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting. We find, you know, we find it to be a very expressive, a very vibrant Alvarino. It's, uh, you know, strong on the nose. Uh, and in, in the palate, it has a, a very nice natural acidity, a very nice minerality, but still quite a lot of fruit. So it's a really good wine for food pairing as well. We have a lot of fun with this at the restaurant, and at the winery. It's kind of like our lamb where we try out different things. But it's incredible how you can go with, you know, white fish or octopus, you know, the, the, the traditional pairings with Alvarino. But you can also jump into spicy food. Um, you know, that acidity cleans the palate very well. So you can really explore if you're alone. Very nice. Uh, I find a lot of nice peach notes as well. Uh, it would be good to to hear after the tasting. I think when, when you guys can ask questions to tell me you know, a bit of feedback from you guys as well. Um, but it's a wine that for us it's just super successful. It's opened a lot of doors, um, and you know it's it's helped us a lot with uh, gaining a lot of attention to media as well because you know there's not a lot of Albarino out there. Uh, I know in New York. There's some, and in Oregon, I've tasted some in the U.S. Albarinos, but it's a very small quantity, from what I know. Um, basically, some of the accolades, um, you know, I know there's some retail accounts here, and some on-premise, so some people care about it, some people don't. I'll just show them quick. <laughs> um, the second one is uh, Rosé. It's 100% Pinot Noir. I didn't mention this, but the whole tier of Reserva, so all four wines we're going to taste, um, on, uh, by the glass pricing is around 12 US, and uh, on retail you'll find around 17 on the shelf. Um, so why I mention that now, it's actually quite uh, difficult to find 100% Pinot Noir uh, at that price point. At least uh, in my experience, um, I'm sure you guys know more. But um, the rosé is a is a fun it's a fun story behind it because it's something uh, we started developing for our domestic market here. Uh, you know, for summer. You know, we have so much tourism on the beach. Uh, it's summer when people come and visit to the winery. We wanted to have a rosé kind of you know to get people freshen up and relax and, you know, be in a couple of restaurants on the beach. 
Um, so the first development of Rosé, we wanted a very pale color, um, you know, some strawberry notes, something very fresh. So it was Pinot Noir. And since we did the first trial in 2016, it's basically booming. Every year we sell out. Um, today we're producing around 130,000 bottles. And still, you know, we're barely reaching the, the next vintage. Um, it's a very fast vinification, basically, to, to achieve this pale color and fresh style. Um, it, the, the, the maceration is super slow, uh, super short. It's basically whatever it takes us to fill in the tanks, the, the press. Uh, so 45, 50 minutes, depends how tired the guys are. We fill in the press, we press, and then we just separate. Uh, so it's, you know, we, we want it to be really pale. Um, and it's incredible. I love it. It's the wine I always have in the fridge. Basically, you know, it's, it's a perfect patio wine you can drink by itself, but it also has some some nice uh, expressions and uh, you know some structure and, and a very nice acidity so you can play it with fruit i always go for really fresh fruits and salads but uh, you know you, you, you can play it a lot as well so beautifully uh, this is the, the 2019. It's been a while for me to taste because uh, this is just uh, anecdotic uh, for you guys. But the Pinot Noir we harvest, it's one of the first we harvest uh, for Rosé. And that is like 22nd of January. It's super early. It's around two weeks earlier than, than Chile or Argentina. Um, and basically, that's because you know, we get quite a lot of sun exposure and and, and it really happens on time. Um, so we actually release the fresh vintage um, mid-April. So since May, we've been selling the 2020 uh, vintage here. So it's something we try to get really fresh to the market. Um, next wine, Cabernet Franc. Um, Cab Franc is a... It's a grape that we're seeing a lot of potential uh, in Garçon. Basically, you know, Uruguay is very well known for Alat. It's the number one red grape. Um, but, you know, when Alberto Antonini was given the task of planting the vineyard, uh, you know, this is a, a, it's 500 acres of vineyard. It's a big risk if you go you know, one grape, and it doesn't work. Yeah, so basically, he just split the, the eggs in many different baskets. And one of them was Cabernet Franc. It was kind of a trial like everything for us. Um, but for the last six years, we've seen a huge development, you know, a beautiful expression of the Cabernet Franc. Um, and it works really well because it ripens earlier. Uh, for us, that's super important. Remember, we have a lot of rain. So even though it drains very fast, um, on some years, the, the, the conditions can be so extreme that, that we could you know, risk um, losing some crops. Actually, Cabernet Sauvignon, we only have two acres. You know, it's something that we cannot wait for to ripen. So Cap Front uh, does the job very nicely. We can pick it early March. And if you pick it on the right time, it's amazing how you get a beautiful balance of, of the red fruit with that green pepper notes that Cap Frank is known for. You know, if you pick it too early, the green pepper is everywhere. Uh, it's very difficult to work with. Uh, and if you pick it too late, the, the, it gets a very jammy style. You know, that red fruit is super, super pleasant. But Frank, if you, would you, time, would you put this balance. light up for the Cap Frank? Sorry? Will you put the slide up for the Cabernet Franc? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Delicious. There you go. Um, so the Cap Franc, uh, basically it's all for what we see, is the big secret is where you pick it. Basically the winemaking team in Uruguay and vineyard managing team, 
are really, really, you know, fine tuning the, the perfect date. So every year we're getting better quality up front. Um, and we see potentially it could be our number one grape in the future. It's something we're planting more and more every year. Um, and it's incredible the, the results we're achieving. Um, here, we, for the Varinho and the Rosé, it was all stainless steel, very fresh style. Here we start playing a bit more. So we use uh, for the fermentation, we do it in concrete cubic tanks. Uh, not, not the tulips that you saw in the picture, those we use for single vineyards and, and icon wines. Here we use regular tanks cubic of concrete without any epoxy. So you have porous on the concrete, that gives you micro oxygenation, works really well through, through the tannins. But also, it's like cooking, you know, you cook with stainless steel or with a clay. Um, the clay thing, basically, you get much more, you know, um, expressions into the into the food. Basically, with the wine, it's the same. Um, you know, all the humidity, the the microbiodiversity that you have in the flora you have in the walls give you a very nice complexity in the wine. Um, and the aging, it's uh, six to twelve months. Um, basically, why we say six to twelve? That's quite a you know big range. Uh, it's because, remember, it's very small blocks. We try to always vinificate each one independently, um, and then we blend. So some go six, some go 12. I would say the, the average is around eight to nine months that, that it gets you know, in oak. And toasted French of um, Showing beautifully the 2018, 2017 you guys have. I couldn't find any because we were out of it, sorry. <laughs> I have the 18. Um, some of the accolades. The, I think we are uh, also doing the 18. Oh, 18? Okay, great, sorry. Uh, so I got the, the site wrong. That was me, sorry. All good, all good. The, the vinification process doesn't change. Um, much from one year to the other. The, the harvest does change, so I'll mention that. The 2018 was, until 2020, we, have, we considered the best harvest, basically because um, it was a very dry year. Uh, it was, 2020 was better because it was also dry, but a bit cooler. 2018, we had a lot of kind of really uh, hot days. So it, it pushed a bit more um, the, the, the ripeness of the, of the grapes and we had to harvest a bit uh, faster, but it was uh, beautiful. You know, we, we really, we could plan the harvest one week uh, prior, you know, one week in advance, which in Uruguay, that's totally unusual. You never know what's gonna happen in two days, it changes it all the time. Um, next wine is Tanat. 2018, basically, Reserva Tanat is our hero wine. This is our, you know, animal horse. Um, and it's what I like to think that has made Garçon uh, famous and, and successful so far. Um, basically, because what my, my way of seeing this is that the winemaking team has been able to has reached, the, they had the ability of taming Tanat. Tanat is known to be huge variety, you know, huge tannins, massive structure. Um, and that's basically because potentially it is, but it's all, you know, it depends how you vinificate it, of course, like everything. So Tanat is known, to, you know, the origin, originally is from Maliran, and it's known for the Maliran style, very big, you have to bottle age in 10 years, you know, quite aggressive. In Uruguay, it's the number one grape, basically because it adapted better than any other. It tolerates very well humidity, rain. Uh, the clusters are very small and tight, so the water just drains out. Uh, so it's kind of a survivor grape in Uruguay, but we wanted to make it very, very approachable. So the number one 
first secret you must know for that is pick it when it has really ripened. So you have to pick the fruit. You know, once the seeds are crunchy, you start picking. If you pick it too early, you know, the green tannins are impossible to work with. It's too powerful. Um, and, and then it's the maceration. You know, that, that's the, the, where you have to be super careful. Um, the winemaking team, you know, tastes two or three times each tank per day. Uh, the, the maceration will be three, four days. Um, once they consider the structure is there, the color is there, you need to have a dark color of that. They basically separate and then we start fermenting. Uh, the fermentation process starts later, so basically you never have uh, maceration while fermenting. This way the tannins, um, you know, round, round it up a lot and they're more gentle uh, and easier to work with. Um, and then the oak, you know, as, as I mentioned, we use big untoasted French oak casks. And we use the big ones basically because Tanat already has structure, so it's mostly to, to give it a bit of uh, complexity, uh, but not, you know, not, not too much uh, on the structure side. And it's, a, it's a wine that pairs very well with, with food uh, here in Uruguay. Uh, Freak fact for everyone to know about Uruguay. It's 3 million people, I mentioned, but we have 12 million cows. So there's four cows per person. So we always say in Uruguay, if we don't eat the cows, the cows will eat us. So, <laughs> so we drink a lot of tannin, we eat a lot of beef, uh, but it's, it's a beautiful pairing. You know, the, the tannins of the tannin cut through the meat, the, through the fat of the meat, beautifully. Um, yeah. Second anecdote, uh, the, the chef being Argentinian, Francis Malman, once uh, he, he, he told in an interview uh, to the New York Times or one of those, that Tanat and Uruguayan beef was a better pairing than Malbec and Argentinian beef. So we put it on the back label of our Tanat and we shipped it to Argentina. That's the kind of relationship we have with them. <laughs> Uh, well, highly, you know, uh, awarded wine. Uh, it got into the top 100 wines of uh, Wine Spectator a couple of years ago. Um, this year, it got the 2018 got the Best Buy. Yeah, it's a wine that, you know, super consistent uh, vintage to vintage. Definitely 2018, you know, it's, it's a huge, uh, huge um, expression of the planet. Very well balanced. The, the tannins, you feel them, they're structured, but quite round, uh, and, and a lot of the red food is still there. And that, that's a secret, you know, being able to, to balance it like that. Um, then I have, you know, some top media that, of course, always helped. Uh, you know, Garçon was the New World Winery of the Year in 2018. Um, this is, well, we, we can jump into the questions if you want. Eh? Wine Enthusiast gives uh, quite a lot of, you know, social media posts. Shanky News Daily has um, done a lot of coverage, Wine Spectator. And all this really helps, you know, because the category of Uruguay uh, is really small uh, worldwide and in the U.S. So we, you know, we go, we go a lot through media to get the word out there. And... A lot of media is really interesting about writing about Gasson, basically, because it's a new story, you know, it's something exciting, um, totally unknown. So it's really, uh, it's been working really well. That's why I think why we're getting a lot of attention to, to the media. This is something I invite everyone to watch. Um, you know, during, during the quarantine, it was, uh, the shutdown, it was better because everyone was home. <laughs> But uh, Amazon Prime did a, a series uh, collaboration with Wine Enthusiast that it's called, it's called It Starts With Wine. You can find it on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's one episode each winery. And the first episode is Bodega Son. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, scenery. It shows you a bit of the, the countryside, the landscape, and Francis Malman cooking our local 
uh, with our local ingredients and Alberto Antonini pairing with, with our local wines. So it's a really nice, easy um, wine uh, cinema. So for everyone to watch. All right. I'll stop sharing screen so we do the questions and we can see everyone asking, right? I um I didn't see any uh, questions in the comment line, but if anybody has any, feel free to to ask. Um, basically about really anything. Alex, a wealth of knowledge. But um, first and foremost, I hope you appreciated the tasting. Um, just some fun additional facts about the winery. Um, speaking to Francis Mallman in the restaurant, and they spare no expense at making everything great. Their restaurant in the winery just won best restaurant in a winery in the world, which is pretty fantastic. Um, and um, the I like. Yeah. 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 Describe it, although the pictures don't do it justice, but basically, if you guys recall the uh, 1994 classic film Jurassic Park, it's basically what you're looking at. Um, <laughs> so there really, there is nothing like it, and hopefully when we can all get traveling again, um, they have been huge supporters and very welcoming um, to get anyone down there if possible. But, um, but that being said, I would love if anyone had any questions um, to facilitate, if anybody had anything. And please feel free at this point to uh, go ahead and open uh, or unmute yourself if you have a question. It's a great point, uh, Carrie, that you mentioned of, of uh, the, the traveling, of course, you know, once that, that's possible again. But um, we, we th we've seen uh, that the best investment we can do is actually getting people to see the place because it's, it's, you know, totally unique in the world. Um, so, you know, if, even if you guys are ever flying down to South America, uh, you know, drop us a, a note. Uh, we'll be glad to, you know, show you around, take you to the winery. Alec, so, I've got a quick question for you. And one of the uh, things that you had mentioned about the uh, success of the Tanat in your fermentation is that you said that the uh, alcohol fermentation and the maceration on the skins never happens at the same time. Uh, obviously, malactic, I'm sorry, malactic, uh, from, uh, alcoholic fermentation raises uh, the uh, endothermic uh, reaction, raises the temperature of the, the wine. Uh, thus, you don't get as much extraction. Obviously, Tanat is a heavy, thick-skinned grape, uh, but it's got a lot of those uh, tannins in it. There is zero fermentation, and, and is it temperature-wise that you keep that uh, temp uh, fermentation from happening? All right, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, basically, Tanat, it's a really good point. Uh, you know, to go deeper into the Tanat, uh, the berry itself, uh, it's very small, very thick skin, and it actually has four to five seeds in each berry. So usually, you know, varieties have two to three. So there's more seeds, and then seeds are a high concentration of tannins. So potentially, yeah, it's a really, really tannin uh, grape. Uh, that's why you have to be very careful. And that's why we do this first maceration and fermentation. How, how we basically um, develop that is, you know, when we fill up tanks and we're macerating, uh, with dry, you know, with dry ice, uh, dry oxide, we just separate. There's no oxygen in contact, so the first, we can avoid fermentation. It's also uh, each of these concrete tanks also have uh, temperature control vests inside the concrete, so we cool the temperature as well. We avoid the fermentation of start, starting uh, because all the fermentations uh, we don't use any commercial yeast. It's just wild yeast. Um, so we basically create an environment where the fermentation doesn't start. Um, and once we have the color and the structure, yeah, then we, you know, we separate, we ch change the tank, and then we, we let it, uh, you know, go the, the, the natural path of the fermenting. Um, and, um, you know, the, it's, we always have quite alcoholic wines, 14 degrees. Basically, that's you know the sun exposure we have. They create quite a lot of sugar on the fruits, um, and it's something you know we can't do much about. Um, 
the, the secret is about really balancing the alcohol into the wine. So you, you know, you don't know it's, um, where, which I think it's really well done. I like, I have a question for you from Teresa regarding the soil types. Um, how many different soil types are you guys working with at the winery? And we spoke to the granite, but if you've got clay, sandy soil. Yeah, th this is basically, th there's different soils depth more than different soils. Basically because the, the granite, all the rock that we saw in the pictures, that, that granite rock, um, you know, in some areas of the vineyard is five, six, seven foot underground. But in some others, it's, you know, it comes out of the surface. You actually see it. So that gives you, uh, you know, a, quite a big spread, uh, spread of different depths of soils. Um, and the other thing that we have, in other words, it's granite boulder rock. So it, it, the granite boulder just meteorizes, you know, decomposes, into small pebbles, which we call ballasto in the way. Uh, and those small pebbles are the, the upper surface, you know, um, one feet, two feet of that. It's 60% is sand. That's why it basically drains so fast. Um, but what you do have, you know, it's not different soil, but what you do have is a different depth, a different orientation to, you know, if it's face day on the hillside facing north or on the other hillside facing south or east. And the other thing that you do also have is it's all hills, right? Rolling hills. So you have the upper, um, the, the top side of the hill blocks and then the bottom and middle and bottom. So for example, the Merlot, we plant in the bottom part, you know, where it's, um, there's more, more, uh, soils um, and, and more, more water drains into the ground than the flat. The flat we plant more the, hill, the top of the hills. So there's still quite a lot of playing that we can do, um, but it's one, one soil that, that, that we know so far. We're still doing a lot of uh, investigations with universities here. Yeah, actually, the, the water making team is very interesting there separating garçons wild yeast uh, to really, you know, uh, it's still quite a lot of investigations, but uh, the soil is one, it's, it's decomposed granite. That, that's it. Alex, I have a question for you, if you yeah. don't mind in. Could you maybe speak a little bit more to the uh, use of the concrete tanks? Um, it came up, it's shown up on the, on, uh, on the slides, um, but also it's, it's, it's mentioned considerably on the website. So I was wondering if maybe um, you could discuss the different kinds of concrete tanks and the different shapes and, and why it's so relevant to, uh, to the production of Garzon wines. Yeah, good, excellent question. Uh, basically, we're using a lot of concrete. Uh, you know, Alberto Antonini's philosophy is to intervene at least as possible. So um, this is just funny, but in his winemaking style and philosophy, there's a lot of no's. No overripening, uh, no uh, over extracting, no over aging, uh, you know, no over oaking, and no over winemaking. You know, the, the whole idea is that the winemaker, you, you don't feel the hands of the winemaker, you know, it's the expression of the fruit. So what we've found with concrete, it, it basically, you know, it's a very easy, I remember hearing this from him and I always say it because it's a very easy way of understanding, you know, why do you use concrete or stainless steel? And he says, you know, stick your head into a stainless steel tank, um, you know, and smell. And there's nothing there, you know, it's sterile. He says, death, you know, that basically doesn't um, give anything to the wine, just preserves better. But stick your head into a concrete tank and, and you know, the smell and you get humidity, you get, you know, all kind of bacteria that is on the walls of the concrete. So there's a much more uh, natural environment. Um, and he also says, you know, why do you live in a concrete house and not in a stainless steel house? Because 
one is also an or living organism that needs that coziness, you know, and, and, and that, that's kind of his philosophy. That's what I'm trying to explain there. But on the technical part, what we're seeing is that concrete helps a lot uh, because concrete breathes. There's, you know, micro oxygenation through the concrete on the porous. So it works a lot on, on, um, on balancing tines, on rounding the tines, um, which is very, very good for our lab. And uh, the shape of the concrete changes a lot. Uh, basically, on a cubic, what we use is cubic um, tanks for the reserva ones. Basically, so it's an even contact with, uh, with skins and most, uh, but then if in the picture I showed, it's the concrete tulip shape tanks. Those that tulip shape, basically, because it has temperature control vests inside, we can play a bit with temperature. So that creates a natural movement of the wine. Uh, that, you know, we, we don't have to do batonage and different, uh, you know, pumping over or anything. It's just a natural movement of the wine. So Again, it's intervening at least as possible. Um, and, you know, with that being such a big great one on tanning wise, doing uh, pump overs, you know, it's very easy to over extract it as well. So, this way we can do longer macerations with the concrete tulip, but it's much more elegant uh, extraction. It's much more balanced into the wine. Um, and you know, it's much softer and elegant uh, at the end of the day. Um, so, so each each of the concrete sh shaped tanks uh, does have a, a huge impact on the wine as well. So Rachel has a question unrelated to concrete, but Teresa just asked about the porousness of concrete. Concrete, and does that affect the lifespan of the concrete material, um, especially with cleaning it and so forth? Yeah. It, it actually, it's, um, it's funny because, you know, we lose wine every year, basically because the concrete also absorbs it. So we, it's the, the angel quote that we lose. Um, and the, the process of cleaning it, it it's, it's important, it's super important. Basically because um, we want to preserve the bacteria on the walls, right? That natural flora. So the only thing that we use is high pressure hot water. We use no chemicals or anything because you know we don't want to kill that bacteria. Every year there's more and more, and, and it does good. But you do have to clean it, of course. You know? So high pressure hot water, and that does the job. Great. And then Rachel had a question about labeling in Uruguay specifically. So we, we've got the Reserva line. Are, is there a certain standard or criteria that's required for that? I know you do work with the single vineyards and above, but within the South American market, you have a tier that does fall below Reserva. So um, what are the standards yeah. for labeling? Yeah, it's a really good question um, and uh, interesting answer because in Uruguay uh, is known to, for being a very liberal country. Uh, and that goes for everything <laughs> and even for wine. So there's actually no rules of, you know, what you can name Reserva. There's actually no appellations. Um, when, that's why we took the name of Garçon because it's the name of the place. Nobody can get it wrong and nobody can copy it. <laughs> but th th we're still working on, you know, creating different appellations in Uruguay because, you know, the conditions in Tarawar are totally different. Um, but no, the, in Uruguay, there's no strict rules. What we do is basically we're very conscious of, you know, quality wise. Uh, our reserva, you know, it's a quality standard for us. So the, the grapes, the, the first big difference is the grape. So the grapes, the fruit that doesn't achieve the quality that we expect, we use for a different tier that we sell mostly here in Uruguay domestically and in Brazil. Um, and then, you know, what, what we feel comfortable with, and that goes into the server, the vinification, it's totally different with the concrete and all this. Um, our entry level um, wines, uh, it's stainless steel only, something, you know, very 
easy to consume and we, and we sell it in Uruguay. Remember, it's a small country, but that doesn't export much wine, but we drink a lot of wine in Uruguay. The wine culture is huge. Uh, we drink around 25 liters per capita. Uh, so I have to transform that into gallons, but yeah, I always have that difficult math. But it's quite a lot. So we drink much more than Chile or Argentina, you know. Uh, the culture of wine is huge. Um, if I could jump in again, uh, Alex, really quickly. Um, uh, when you show the slide of the different varietals that are being grown there, um, doesn't necessarily exactly match up with the wines that, 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 that I see on your list of, of available wines. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit to, um, there's a VNDA and there's some, just some other varietals that are on there that don't, there aren't expressions for uh, in the portfolio. And what, what's the use of those other varietals in, in, in some of the wines or are they, you know, vineyard only, yeah. state only or? It's a great question. Do you, do you want me to show you the slide so we can chat through it? Let me, let me put it back. Because it's a really good question that, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot you can talk about. Oh, sorry. Wait a second. Uh, there we go. So, what you see here is 16 different grapes. Uh, you know, there's Vermentino uh, that I've, myself, I've never tasted even the, from the Vermentino. But basically, these are all the trials. You know, there's one block, two blocks that are constantly experimenting, you know. Um, for example, Petit Manseng, it's all the yellow one, right? Petit Manseng, they planted quite a lot uh, when they started because the, the owner loves um, dessert wine, sweet wine. Um, and Alberto Antonini also saw the thought that, you know, potentially could be a really good steel uh, white wine as well. Um, with time, we've seen it's a very tricky grape. The production is very small, um, super expensive. You know, the ratio of hectare to fruit and fruit to wine is ridiculous. So all this area, the north facing Petit Matseng, we actually recrafted it with Cap Franc. So this is kind of the experimental that I was mentioning. You know, we're still learning um, and there's still a lot of things changing. So here there's eight hectares, so around 16 acres. Um, of different that we've re recrafted with Cap Franc. Um, it was nearly half of the Petit Montseng, four hectares. Um, we did, we do, uh, we kept, I think it's two hectares, so around four acres of Petit Montseng that we do for dessert wine that we sell mostly at the winery in the restaurant uh, and for the owner. <laughs> it's his favorite wine, so you need to have it. Um, but, you know, this is kind of, the, the ongoing development that I was mentioning. You know, the, the Pinot Noir, at the beginning, we planted it, you know, the, the 10 acres took a couple of years to, to reach that. We started very small for red Pinot, um, and then we started developing the Rosé, and now, you know, I think today we have more. This is not updated at all uh, today, but the Pinot Noir, I think today we are around 13 hectares. So we're still, you know, uh, these numbers do change. Some of the grapes go out and new ones come in. The Cap Sauvignon is still very small. The Chard we use for sparkling. Uh, it's a blanc de blanc, the Champenois method that we use. Um, the Verdejo, I think it gets mostly blended. I've never tasted it either. But Bionier, for example, we sell in Uruguay domestically. 100% Bionier. Um, same for Pinot Grigio. Um, yeah. Alec, would you mind pulling the slide up that has all of the wines, um, including the Bellastro yeah. and the single vineyard? 
I just want to note, Glenn's is an amazing partner and they've actually brought in the entire portfolio, aside from some limited availability that you'll see under the Petit Clo line. So with the reserve, of course, today you tried just the four wines, but we do also have a Sauvignon Blanc, a Marcelon, and then um, in the single vineyard series, we have a single vineyard Albarino. And the Petit, or sorry, the Pinot Noir that you tried in the Rosé, we don't have a standard Rosé Reserva, but we do have a single vineyard that I have blinded people on and they thought we were in France and it is really good. And they also have a Petit Verdot and Tanat. Um, so those are all at Glunds right now. Um, and then also the, the Belasto, which we spoke about, which is the feather in the cap, um, that is also available um, at Glunds. So I really wanna thank them for being a great partner in working with the whole portfolio. And uh, let's see, can you- If, if I may, uh, um, just briefly talk you, talk you through the Balasto. Uh, remember, Balasto is what we call here to our soil, the decomposed granite. And it's basically um, a blend of our top components, every vintage. So the blend changes year to year. Um, most of the times is Tanat, Cap Franc, Marcelan, and then some Petit Verdot or Merlot. Right, those are the five grapes we play with. Um, and it's kind of a really bold project for us to release an icon wine. We released it in 2015 vintage. It was very young, but we wanted to show the potential of such a young vineyard, right? At that point, it was seven, six year old vines. Um, and the balance was beautiful. So we took it to Bordeaux for a big fair. Uh, to show it to some media, you know, get people to talk about it, maybe, let's see. Um, and it caught the attention of the Bordeaux Negociants. So it was amazing. It actually got released through the Place de Bordeaux. And that was the, the launching of the wine into the world. Um, so September 2017, we released the, the 2015 vintage. And now every September, we release... The, the fresh vintage of Balasto. Uh, it's amazing because it's only three wines from South America uh, at the Blas de Bordeaux. Uh, so super proud you know, for, for us. Uh, and for the owner being Argentinian, there was no Argentinian wine in the Blas de Bordeaux. So it was a cool, good comeback for all the bully he received of investing in Uruguay. <laughs> Now, I want to be cognizant of time. Um, I know you guys have yeah. given us plenty today. I do have another question from Perry, just regarding the Marcelon, and then um, if we want to wrap up or if there's any more questions, if you want to fire them into the chat. Um, but Perry's asking about Marcelon as a grape. I mean, if you want to quickly just mention what Marcelon is, um, and then we can speak, I can speak regionally of the successes with Marcelon and the on and off premise, because it does have its application, but it is unique. Um, but if you wouldn't mind just telling everyone yeah. about Marcelan. Super interesting. Um, it's a great question. Marcelan is a crossing of Cap Sauvignon and Grenache. Um, it, it was crossed, it was invented in 1971 in, in France, South France. Um, basically, they wanted to develop a Cap Sauvignon profile wine with earlier ripeness. Uh, you know, because of the, the difficult harvest that you can have in France. Um, the result is uh, early ripeness, but it definitely not Cap Sauvignon uh, style uh, profile. It's quite different. Uh, it's, uh, the structure is very smooth. There's a lot of fruit, very dark color. So it's kind of, uh, you know, a tricky grape. If you look at it, you expect, you know, something quite... Uh, big, uh, but the structure is really smooth. It's really easy to drink with a lot of fruit, a bit of spiciness. Um, and it's a grape that works really well uh, for us in Uruguay because it ripens early, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, it, it was approved last year by uh, Bordeaux. So it's now a, a, a variety they can use in Bordeaux. Um, and it's widely planted in China. It's, um, the Chinese are taking it as their national grape. It's what they're planting the most. Um, and the last couple of years, the best Chinese wine has been a Marcelan. So it's a grape that we're hearing more and more about. Um, we planted it initially for blending because the dark color, a lot of fruit, 
and not big structure. So we already had that. So we thought, you know, this could be a good uh, blending component. Uh, but now we bottle it 100% by itself because it's very interesting and we're seeing a lot of young sommeliers that want to have that totally unique wine, you know, obscure grape, unknown origin, you know, Marcel from Uruguay. <laughs> you cannot go darker than that, I guess. Um, so it has kind of a really cool, you know, follow behind. Sorry, yeah, like no, no, I, I, I would say that the successes that I've seen in the, have been primarily on premise with the, tend to be more of a younger buyer. I've described it stylistically almost like Pinot Meunier, if you were to have it um, fermented, because it's got that kind of body, but then um, fruit. So um, yeah, without, with that being said, um, and again, I just, I, I wanted to state it within an hour or so. Um, did anyone else have any other questions for Alec or just shout outs about maybe just tears of joy of how great your experience has been today. It's great. Hey everyone, it was fantastic. Hope to visit you soon. And that being said, like I said, everything um, we've shown you and then some is available with Guan's great partners and the pricing is pretty ridiculous. So yeah, non-tariffed Albarino, um, a Pinot Noir Rosé, sub 12 bucks wholesale. But yeah, thank you again for your time. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Joe and yeah. Awesome, Cheers. well thank you all very much, Alec. Thank you very much for taking time out of your uh, deep winter uh, hibernating uh, to come join us. And uh, thank you all for joining us here. Alec's gonna show us his... I'll show everyone because you guys are, it's turning up. We took too long, it, it, it's dying on. <laughs> Throw another log on, my friend. Stay warm, but thank you all very much for joining us for another great Zoom, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, next week. Everyone, pleasure. Thank you, everyone. I am. And the